Hey everyone, my name is Paul Kretz and today I'm making a review on the lens which I have never met on the web or anywhere, anywhere else. I've never seen a review of this lens neither in a written form or on a video, so this might be quite a unique review for us. And just in case nobody does that, let's get started. Uh, and we'll be testing this lens, I'll show you the test pictures of this lens on a full frame and on a Canon APS-C body. So, this is the lens. Alright, so what's the type of lens we're dealing with today? And this is the so-called Bokeh Monster, which means that this lens might be having a big focal length and a wide maximum aperture. So the big focal length means that you can shoot far away from you, it will, so to say, zoom out, zoom in, I mean, for you, so you can shoot in it on a distance, and that, in its turn, will make your subject look separated from the background or from, from the foreground. If you stay closer to your subject and the background is far behind, then it will make the background blurred, and the foreground blurred while the subject is in focus. And as well, the big focal length uh, creates a compression, which makes the background look closer to your subject, which is in focus. And on the other hand, the wide maximum aperture does pretty much the same with the blurred background and foregrounds. So the wider the aperture, the more background blur you receive. And as well, the wide aperture lets in much more light. So comparing these two factors, these lenses are called Bokeh Monster because Bokeh is another title for the blurred back and foregrounds. So this is the type of the lens we're dealing with today. And these lenses can be good for portraits, obviously, so to separate your subject from your back and foreground and to get really blurred those areas. And uh, these uh, lenses can also be good for wildlife, for not far away wildlife. Let's say birds on the trees or cats, dogs, ducks, and countryside animals, something like that. You won't be able probably to shoot wild beasts somewhere, you know, on the safari or something like that. It would be hard, not enough focal distance, but uh, uh, focal length, I mean. But for the uh, closer subjects, uh, for wildlife, not for distant far uh, wildlife, it's going to be good. And sometimes these lenses are also good for macro photography, if they allow to get closer to your subject and have minimal focusing distance quite decent, but it's not always so. But anyway, these lenses, these big uh, focal length and wide maximum aperture are almost always really expensive. If you see into the um, original or native lenses from Canon, Nikon or other brands, they're really expensive and you can't uh, get your hands on them unless you are rich. So, the one we're looking into today is really, really cheap. And the other factor is size. These lenses are always big and probably heavy. And the one we have today is not so big as you see. But we'll get into this a little bit later. And this is really, really cheap. So I'll tell you how and for how much I bought it. Well, this one, as you probably understood from the visuals, this is a vintage manual lens, which means there's no automatics here. It only focuses by your fingers, you mean by the hand. So only manual focusing and manual aperture. So these vintage lenses mostly were made, manufactured from probably mid 60s to 1990s. Of course, some were made before that, some after, but the most useful and popular, still popular vintage lenses on the market are probably manufactured from the 60s to 90s. And uh, mostly even before that, probably before uh, the middle of the 1980s, because the Canon EOS system, on which I'll be testing the uh, lenses today, uh, was invented in 1987. So, of course, the autofocusing systems were created before, there were some uh, items of that type, but mostly we consider the vintage era stopped uh, being actual on the 1987. And unfortunately I have no idea when and where this lens was manufactured, we'll get into this in a moment. Vintage lenses are mostly popular for their great, great, great build quality and for focusing rings with long turning path, 
which makes it the very precise for manual focusing, of course, because there was no autofocus at those times. You had to be really precise with your menu focus. And that's the case with this uh, particular lens. But that is the question. How do you focus manually with the contemporary autofocusing systems, the uh, autofocusing bodies, let's say? Well, it's quite easy, um, as a matter of fact, because all contemporary camera, I'm telling uh, about uh, Canon EOS systems right now, but I'm pretty much sure the other brands have the same too. The cam all Canon cameras, including the very old, which I have right here, the very old uh, full-frame one, on which I'm be t testing this uh, lens as well, uh, already have the conf focus confirmation. Uh, so if you're focusing manually, even manually, the autofocusing points light up and the camera beeps when the point is in focus. And besides that, you also have the Magic Lantern software for Canon cameras. This is a third-party software that can be installed in your camera, mostly on old cameras before probably 2016. All those cameras might be having a Magic Lantern and this software has a lot of instruments to help you focusing. For example, focus peaking. Some of modern Canon cameras already have focus peaking built in, but at those times, the before 2016, uh, they d didn't have that, so Magic Lander allowed to do that. And there were some other instruments like uh, Trap Focus and Magic Zoom and so on. So if you're interested, just get into Magic Lantern and you will find out what are some other features that can help you manually focusing. But uh, judging by, from my experience, it's really not a problem. I've tested it on different uh, cameras and uh, manual focusing is not so bad um, as well. And of course, the easiest way to focus manually is with your fingers and by your eye, which is uh, sometimes even more useful and accurate, accurate than the focusing uh, with the autofocus. And why is that? Because our eyes see much more than camera sensors, really. So in the, in the dark conditions, you really better focus with um, your eyes. So you, you, the autofocus can always, um, can often miss in the dark conditions. And the same applies to, let's say, portrait photography, especially with wide maximum apertures and big focal length. The depth of field becomes so, so narrow that it's really hard for autofocusing system to recognize, you know, let's say the eye from the eyebrow or the cheek and so on. You know, contemporary systems have the eye autofocus, that's good. But if you have to deal with manually focusing, then I mean, it's better to focus manually than with inaccurate fo uh, autofocus. And the same applies to macro photography because the depth of field is also tiny and you can't get, always get in focus with the autofocus. And if the uh, scene, you know, the composition is complicated with a, a lot, a uh, big number of uh, small objects, the autofocus can also be confused. So the manual focusing is uh, really useful. Probably that's why all, even all contemporary lenses still have, always have manual focusing. None of the brands uh, completely reject manual focusing because it works. But even if you're focusing by your eye, you will still have to adapt this vintage lens to your camera body somehow. And that means that the, these lenses, they had different mounts, but this particular lens, for example, have the M42 screw mount, screw thread, like this, you see. And so you have to buy this adapter. In this instance, it's M42 to EOS, to Canon EOS adapter. This is the cheapest one, but it still has the electronic contacts, as you see. So you screw this adapter onto the lens, and then you can, you can attach this lens to any camera body. We'll do this later. But this is, the, as I said, the, the very cheapest adapter, and it only helps to measure exposure and uh, confirm focus. So even the cheapest adapter, this is Chinese one for a few dozen bucks, no, for a few bucks, I must say. Yeah, it's only a few bucks. But it, it confirms focus. That's the main point. That's the main reason to buy this. It really confirms uh, a focus. There are even cheaper adapters without electronic contact, so you only will have to uh, focus by your eyes, by your eyes only. But this uh, confirms uh, focus. 
but with this adapter you cannot write the exit file with all your parameters that you want. The camera will measure the exposure and the shutter speed because it's decided by itself and it will read this, uh, write this information into exe file but the file will not contain the focal length and the aperture because that's the prerogative of these, the lens and this adapter does not convey this information to camera so you probably have to buy the more expensive it's about three times ex more expensive adapters and I've already ordered this uh, one, uh, the one but it still I haven't received I haven't received it yet um, we'll probably test it later but with this adapter you can easily shoot and the more expensive adapter you can even program so that it conveys the information on focal length and aperture to the body I just recently learned that Canon, Canon cameras, some of the Canon cameras can program, they have programming mode and then they can program these adapters to convey the information to camera so that's just bear in mind that there are different types of adapters but this cheap adapter will only tell the camera the weird, <laughs> very weird uh, focal length and the f1.4 aperture all the time no matter, no matter what the real aperture is so let's look into the lens itself as I told you I've never seen this particular lens anywhere and what is it? I'll show you the barrel, the front element of the lens if you see I hope you see it well it says Super Maric Saw 135 millimeters f2.8 and there is a serial number here so if you can recognize this lens you can find out when and where it was manufactured please let me know in the comments below and what else we can see on the lens is the encry encryption lens made in Japan that's the only information we have so this is the Japanese lens I've seen and you probably did too a few lenses with the name Merrick Saw, but I've never seen this particular one, Super Merrick Saw, with these characteristics, and I've never seen the lens of this particular design. So, this is quite a unique lens, at least for me. If you've seen it and you know anything about it, let me know in the comments below. Well, how did I bought it? Well, actually, I got interested in, in lenses uh, long ago and I've been searching and I've learned that there are bokeh monsters and I started looking for them on, in the local um, Android applications, you know, online trade. And I just found this uh, lens for very, very cheap. It costed only for, as I've told you previously, around $35 and, and uh, about five bucks for delivery so it's got no more than forty dollars for this bulky monster that's a steal really by the way I have some few more vintage lenses here and if you're interested if you like my review we we'll, can discuss these lenses uh, in future reviews considering these lenses I'm just uh, this is a, just a little spoiler these lenses are really far superior than this one well anyway, at the time, at the time of the purchase of this lens, I didn't have a full frame body. I only have had a Canon EOS 70D and 600D, which is T3i. So I tested it on the, that uh, camera and it was not very good, but I'll tell you show you the pictures later. And then uh, finally later I purchased my first and only uh, Canon 5D Classic, which is the Mark I Canon 5D, which is a full-frame camera. And actually these lenses, they were aimed at full-frame. At the times these lenses were produced, there were no APS-C cameras, there were uh, film, ca film cameras, no digital cameras at th those times. So these lenses are for full-frame uh, 36 by 24 millimeters uh, film uh, frame. So this is actually a full frame lens, but it can be adapted to the APS-C with the same adapter, with the same lens mount. But bear in mind that 132 millimeters and f2.8 on full frame will look like 216 millimeters and a relative aperture of 4.5 on an APS-C camera, which is not bad as well because uh, you know, 216 f 4.5 is not bad on APS-C. Uh, let's say, let's compare it to some other lenses, you know, like a super zoom lenses or telephoto zoom lenses for APS-C cameras. 
they always go beyond f5 or mostly f5.6 when they go uh, beyond uh, 200 millimeters. So 216 f4.5 uh, is not bad. It's quite a nice uh, amount of light and still the blurred background is going to be bigger than on uh, conventional APS-C telephoto zoom lenses. Now let's inspect the build quality. As almost all vintage lenses, this is a fully metal lens, you know. It's uh, really no, no plastic parts in here. So I'll unscrew the adapter again and show you the barrel of the lens. It's full metal, so it's very, very solid and the build quality is really great. No problem with that. It's very firm, very hard. Let's see inside the barrel. Well, and what else? This, it has a kind of a strange construction because that there are two parts of the lens, the, uh, the back barrel, let's say, and the front barrel. And the front barrel is actually the focusing ring, which means there is no dedicated focusing ring, but the whole part of the lens, the upper part, is the focusing part. So as you see, the whole thing is rotating and the whole thing serves for focusing. And it is very, very smooth and precise. I must say, it, it might probably even the smoothest focusing ring, well, focusing barrel in this case, that I have a, uh, ever touched. I haven't got my hands on the Canon L lenses, which are very famous for their build quality and smooth uh, focusing rings, but I had to deal with around 30-35 different lenses and none of them, even the uh, expensive ones, had such smooth focusing rings. This is absolutely brilliant. Very, very smooth and very uh, comfortable focusing ring. Well, the focusing barrel. And it has the distance markings on it, so the focusing distance is written here. So you can orient yourself with this and the minimum focusing distance on this lens is uh, around one and a half meters. So that's quite far and it will be hard to shoot with the, in the macro mode, so to say. And the infinity starts from 30 meters. So when you're focusing to 30 meters or further, everything's gonna be in focus. Well, anyway, the, it has the, uh, the rubberized uh, part on this, so it's very comfortable, very convenient and very precise focusing part. Below that the lens has the hyperfocal scale. Let's see into this. And it can be useful in some occasions. And lower than that we have a very narrow aperture ring. And it's not very comfortable because it's really narrow and it's hard to get on it with your fingers, but it is clickable and the clicks are quite hard to do. It really clicks hard, which in some cases it's really good because you cannot click it accidentally. <laughs> it's almost impossible to click it accidentally. But in other cases, you know, it's not so far or fast and you have to, you know, and you have to apply some power to turn this ring. Well, these, uh, the aperture ring has a full stop clicks. Unlike most of vintage lenses which have half a stop click, these have a full stop click which makes it 2.8, then f4, then 5.6, then f8, f11 and f16, which is not very precise, of course, um, both with the blurred background and the amount of light which it gets. Most vintage lenses have a half of a stop apertures and most of modern electronic lenses uh, have one third of a stop in the exposure by the aperture. And the other thing I want to tell you about this aperture ring on this particular lens is that it can stuck. Really, in a round week or two, if you do not use this lens and you do not turn this ring, I'll show it to you right now, it can stuck and I'll, it, it is in this state right now. So, I'm just turning the aperture ring and you see nothing happens. The aperture doesn't move inside the lens. And I noticed it after a while when I purchased this lens and I wanted to do something about it, and so I disassembled the lens by myself. 
which is not so hard as you see without an adapter there are only three screws which if you unscrew you'll get inside the lens I'll show it to you in a b-roll while I'll tell you my uh, story of repairing this lens right now so just watch the b-roll and listen to me well I unscrewed these uh, three screws and got into the lens and what I saw there, I thought there's going to be a really complicated mechanism and I'm not a tech guy, so I was not going to mess up with this lens. I just wanted to see if it's easy, then I'll fix it, and if not, I will not t touch this. But I found out it's not so bad uh, and I managed to fix some parts inside, as you see on the B-roll, and the aperture started working, but when I assembled, assembled the lens back, I noticed that my aperture ring <laughs> become uh, undeclicked. So it smoothly turned and the aperture closed smoothly. And I couldn't find out what happened, so it, it was declicked. And then I got my lens brought to the uh, guy to, for service. It's really hard to find the manual lenses service these days, because they do not deal with it. But I managed to find a guy who really uh, specifically deals with vintage lenses and he repaired it and it uh, turned out that uh, I missed, I lost the very tiny metallic ball uh, which was responsible for clicking. And so this guy uh, returned this little metallic ball which you see on this uh, B-roll uh, to the lens and he inspected and checked the lens and he told me, told me that the lens was uh, probably disassembled before and there's, there's a very very tiny scratch on the glass inside I hope you'll see that in this scene or oh, I'm not sure if you can see this I'm not seeing it myself but anyway these tiny scratches on such big focal length I never, I, I never seen in real pictures so that's absolutely not a problem. Well, all in all, he inspected the lens and he said it's absolutely all right. And the guy uh, calibrated the focusing mechanism and returned the ball. So it's clickable again. But in just as I told you, if you don't want the aperture to be a full stops clicks, you can really disassemble it, throw away the little ball, and it will become smooth and declicked and you can set any aperture value that you want without particular figures. And after repair, I hope that now it's uh, clickable and it's gonna work and it worked, but still after a couple of weeks of not using it, the uh, aperture got stuck. And so now from time to time I have to, you know, come through this uh, repair, it's a, call it so, procedure which I showed you on a B-roll. So, Every couple of weeks I have to make it work again. Probably the worst thing with the focusing mechanism on this lens is that these, this uh, barrel, this focusing barrel, is rotating while you're focusing, which makes it practically not uh, impossible to use uh, filters with this. It has a filter thread of 55 millimeters, so you, you can screw filters in here and uh, you can use of course UV filters and ND filters without any problems but if you're going to be using a circular polarizer filter or the gradual filter then it, that will be a problem because if you uh, use the filter and you uh, set it to the value that you want to the scenery that you want and you then try to focus then your filters you know obviously turns and it will, will mess up and spoil your picture so that's a problem with all lenses with uh, rotating outer parts and comparing its size let's compare it to some you know zoom lens that I have here it's the classic 75 to 300 millimeters f4 to 5.6 uh, the, probably the cheapest zoom lens for the telephoto zoom lens for Canon full frame and let's see how they compare this is relatively small and this is focused to infinity and if I focus closer of course the outer element extends and rotates but if I zoom out this to 300 millimeters and focus <laughs> it's just twice as uh, the size of this vintage Japanese lens. So anyway, and this lens at uh, 135 mils is around f5 and it's 5.6 uh, 
beyond 200 millimeters so this is as i have told you on a full frame this is a, mm, a solid 2.8 and on the APS-C it's gonna give you uh, like a 4.5, which is not bad. So this is relatively uh, small and you can compare it with my hand. And my hand is not big for a man hand. And I'm pretty much sure that this lens is smaller than the dedicated uh, Canon modern lenses like uh, 135 f2 and so on. And this is another bulky monster of the same similar characteristics and they look probably the same. So vintage lenses are quite small, metallic, uh, reliable and solid. The good thing about this focusing barrel is that it has a very long uh, focusing path and rotating path. You see, you can rotate and rotate it and rotate it. So it's around 320 degrees and this is not only comfortable and fine, it was necessary at those times because lens did not have autofocus, as I've told you. Uh, so it had to be really precise and modern lenses do not have, do not need to have uh, really long uh, ring paths because the autofocus is quite fast and precise and it can turn the ring and um, follow the focus very fast and so it's not needed for long distance just to waste the time but in this instance on vintage lenses you have to be very precise so the turning path is very very long now i believe that's enough of the talk now let's get to the, my computer and see the test features which i did with this lens on a canon full frame and aps-c bodies